months ago. And so maybe after class, if you, you know, you're hanging out, pandemic, watching TV, it's really good to watch. Oh, cool. But it'll give yeah. you the whole story. I'm going to have to put that there. Um, Cap maintains a, uh, you, you had a um, GitHub gist of all interesting links. Is that correct? Yep. I'll, I'll um, send that out afterwards. Cool. Well, you should add this Red Hat link to it too. It's be, in there. Uh, oh, cool. Fantastic. Next slide, please. Next slide, Carlotta. Okay, great. Thanks. So since um, since the mid or late 2000s, Willow Garage has disbanded. Today, Open Robotics, of which uh, Kat is uh, part of, is a nonprofit organization that maintains the core ROS developments as well as its roadmap. This includes the latest developments for ROS 2, which is version 2 of the original ROS. We'll talk more about the differences between ROS and uh, ROS 1 and ROS 2 later. But uh, ROS 2 has been in development since 2014. It's a near total re-implementation of ROS version 1, and it fills in some of the shortcomings and inefficiencies of the original ROS. Since 2014, when ROS 2 development started, a number of ROS 2 releases have been made. The latest ROS 2 release is called Foxy Fitzroy, and that's what we'll be using with our hands-on coding examples. Um, despite our focus of uh, talking about ROS2 and, um, and coding with ROS2, uh, for the remainder of the next couple of uh, slides, we're actually going to be just talking about uh, ROS design concepts for that apply to both ROS1 and ROS2. Next slide. So despite its name, ROS is not an operating system. It doesn't implement memory management or task scheduling, what you would expect from a traditional operating system. ROS is more of like a robotics development framework, and it draws similarities to web development frameworks such as Django and Ruby on Rails, which you probably are more familiar hearing about. As all good frameworks go, it offers developers a couple of things. It so, uh, offers developers a way to modularize the functional components of their code. It gives the developers a means to share their modules with others so that you can minimize reinventing the wheel. The framework should also provide a bunch of tools to help you debug and test your modules. And uh, all this is provided without compromising the scalability of your system. So unlike Django, which can be programmed with Python, only, only with Python, or Rails, which could only be programmed with Ruby, ROS actually has, uh, you can program ROS using both C++ and Python. They are both supported by open robotics as first class citizens. There are other languages as, such as Rust um, to help you program ROS and Rust, but those are supported by the community and are considered third party supports. Um, for this workshop, we'll be focusing on learning ROS to using Python. Any questions or Kat, you want to, um, anything else to add? No, we're good. Let's press ahead. Okay, let's see. Make sure there's nothing in the chat here. Okay. Next slide, please. So as a framework that encourages modularity and sharing of modules, hundreds of these ROS robotics modules, both ROS1 and ROS2 have been developed by the community and basically established ROS as the de facto standard in robotics research and development. As a roboticist who knows ROS, you can immediately develop and contribute to a large variety of different robotics organizations and projects, i.e. get cool jobs in robot, building robots, that is. Next slide. So I've been repeatedly mentioning modularity in the sharing of modules. Now, um, I'm going to start to formally define some ROS nomenclature. A ROS module, a shareable ROS module, is more formally called a package in ROS speak. A ROS package is sort of like a bucket that consists of a number of individual ROS execution units. And each one of these execution units are called a node. And node is another uh, ROS nomenclature. One node can say implement the reading of an image from a web camera. You can have another node that reads an image from a USB camera. I don't think we're on the right slide, by the way. Yeah, there, there we go, previous slide. Okay, 
Um, and uh, where was I? So one node can implement the, uh, the reading of an image from a web camera. Another node can read the image from a USB camera. And you have a third node that takes all those images and extracts facial features from the images. Each node runs separately from each other. And uh, we'll be implementing one of these nodes later in the hands-on coding section. Anybody have any questions so far? Okay, next slide, please. I have a question. Yes. So those nodes, uh, are these standardized or are these something that just comes with a package that we can change as we go? Good question. Um, both actually. So you can, as a developer, you can implement your own node and uh, you can also reuse a node that someone else can, has implemented. And that usually is bundled up in a package which is the, if you recall uh, my saying, it's the, that's the, the shareable module, if you will, of the ROS framework. Does that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> okay. I think um, uh, re-raise that question again uh, after, right, right after we talk a little bit more about um, packages uh, and publishers and subscribers, which may help shed some light on how these, these nodes and packages can be shared, okay? All right, next slide. So the nodes communicate with each other using um, a publisher subscriber architecture. This publisher subscriber architecture actually has nothing to do with robotics, but it reinforces modularity. Um, the pub sub architectures used in many other systems as well uh, outside of robotics. It's a computer science design pattern and uh, used in even backend website systems. In the ROST pub sub architecture, nodes communicate bundles of messages or bundles of data to each other called ROST messages. The ROS messages is another nomenclature uh, in, in ROS speak. The messages are sent from a publisher downstream to a subscriber. The nodes are agnostic to who is upstream or downstream from each other. So it doesn't care who is publishing the messages that it's subscribed to. And nodes that are publishers don't care who's subscribing to the messages that it's publishing. Um, topics, the messages are published through these concepts. These are Again, raw spe in raw speak, these concepts are called topics. Um, topics are like telephone numbers. The flow of messages flow through each one of these topics, and they do not cross through different topics. All good so far? All right, let me look at the chat. Okay, Man, no questions. Uh, next slide, please. So to exemplify how the pub sub design can encourage modularity and sharing, here's an example. And hopefully this sheds some light onto the previous question that was asked. Um, the top right node is implemented by team A. It could be a hardware driver that reads LIDAR data. Um, everyone here knows light, what a LIDAR is. It is a, um, a sensor that sprays out laser rays and can measure the range of whatever it hits in front of you. In any case, um, so this uh, team A uh, implements a hardware driver that reads LiDAR data. It publishes the LiDAR data as a range data message downstream. Team A also implements the bottom right node, which subscribes to the range data messages to create, say, a 3D point cloud. On the left side, there's a node that's implemented entire, by an entirely different team, team B, and it can subscribe to this range data message. And, but instead of creating point cloud, it takes it and says, and does something like create a 2D map out of it. Okay, any questions? Jack, I'm a little unclear about the topic uh, still. Is topic a box, what is the function of it? Um, good question. A topic is, it could, you can think of it as a channel. So messages are, are serial or bundles of data. And so say uh, you have, you just sprayed your environment 
with your LIDAR and you have a whole bunch of range sensing data. You take this up and you put it together in a message, which is sort of like a glorified class, which you're able to um, uh, put together in a series of bytes. Then you send this out. Uh, when you send it out, the topic is the channel that you send it through. So um, to prevent your message from being sent to every node out there, you create a topic called say range, range sensing data. So you only send your range sensing data through the range sensing data topic. Therefore, only people who subscribe to that topic will get your message. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay. it's a, it, uh, like, let me interject. It's a little bit like a wire, right? So if you wanna say like, oh, I wanna wire this thing to this thing, a topic is the sort of wire that lets the two things communicate. And it's sort of one directional, like, oh, I'm going to send messages and I'm going to receive messages. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Much simpler, much simpler explanation. Thanks, Kat. <laughs> All right. Uh, next slide, please. As mentioned before, the shareable modules of ROS are called ROS packages. To continue with our, uh, our previous example of uh, these two packages or the, these two teams, um, team B simply reuses the package from TA, team A to re-implement or to implement its mapping, 2D mapping node. Um, we presented a number of ROS terms already. Um, they are highlighted in red. Um, let's take a moment to summarize all of, uh, all of these terms. Um, ROS2 nodes are units of execution. They run independently as separate from other nodes. ROS2 messages are bundles of data communicated, um, bundles of data to communicate from one node to, the, to another. Uh, the topics are like, uh, as Kat mentioned, are like wires uh, or channels where the where, through which the messages flow through. Uh, nodes can be publishers or they can be subscribers and they don't need to know who's subscribing or publishing uh, through the topic that they care about. There are some other terms highlighted in blue. Um, nodes have actually other ways of communicating data to each other as well. And uh, the, specifically, these are uh, called services, uh, which consists of service servers and service clients. They're important in ROS, but we won't be touching upon them today. So um, this is summarization. Any questions about these uh, nomenclature terms or any further questions? Uh, just uh, a quick uh, question here. And I know you said we're not gonna touch on it. And so uh, one of the things you did say was that uh, we, 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 we need a topic, right? To be able to determine uh, what, so, so that when we we'll send out the message, it goes it, it goes through a specific place and doesn't hit all the nodes, right? Uh, so let's say package A is as what we're using to send the message out there, right? And package B is the recipient of this message. Um, are we are we as a as a service client and service uh, server going to match the recipient and the and the giver of the message, or it doesn't matter? It goes, okay. does it go yeah, it's 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 magic. That's kind of what Ross does. Is it does it? It's the abstraction that does all that for you. Okay. Yeah, and so there's some stuff that sometimes oh you have to rewire stuff and say oh I got the wrong names and stuff, but it's pretty easy. Okay. Yeah, and we'll we'll give you guys some examples. We'll we'll show you this in the real world. We're just kind of like giving the high level, and then we'll get some hands on. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, keep the questions asking. The uh, the dumbest questions are the ones not asked, so don't be shy. Um, next slide, please. So all the terms and concepts that we talked about, the, the nomenclature, ROS speak terms that we've been mentioning, they're actually ROS2 terms. They're not specific to either ROS1 or ROS2. They're applicable to both ROS versions. Um, but uh, now we're going to basically start to kind of uh, differentiate between the two. Um, ROS1 is going to end support in 2025, and I hopefully I get this right every single time. It is 2025, right? So far, Kat? Okay. <laughs> um, so I am personally motivated to see the ROS community focus on ROS2. Uh, and what are the differences? Well, uh, there are a couple. Um, here are here is a very very um, 
grossly summarized uh, difference between the between ROS one and ROS two, which I think are the most salient. ROS one requires you to explicitly launch a publisher subscriber broker. So remember, ROS is built on top of this publisher subscriber design pattern. Uh, in ROS one, you need a broker to create the topology of how all these nodes are connected. Who are the publishers? Who are the subscribers? What are the topics that, um, that connect every, everybody together? This process is called the ROS1 master. Without the ROS1 master, ROS1 messages uh, from one node won't find its way to another node because it doesn't know the topology. Uh, some, something needs to create this topology. In ROS2, you don't need to run, run or launch a ROS master explicitly. It, um, as each ROS2 node starts up, it will automatically, uh, if that's a computer science term, register its topics and services with other ROS2 nodes that care. And the publisher subscriber topology of how all these nodes are connected is maintained automatically again without any sort of centralized master or broker. The, um, is that clear to everyone or? Uh, okay. I, that was the question I was, I was wondering about, but mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, how things are connected. Yes. Right. Cool. So uh, to resummarize, Ross one has a master or in publisher subscriber in, in official computer science pub sub architecture terms, it's actually called a broker, but in ROS1, it's called a master. Uh, but that maintains the topology. In ROS2, you don't need an explicit master. It's done for you um, automatically under the hood. So uh, in addition to not having a ROS1 master, um, the, the build systems for both ROS versions are slightly different. In ROS1, uh, you use this build system called Catkin. In ROS2, uh, there's a build system called Calcon. Uh, they both build the system. Uh, I mentioned this because as you're working, looking at maybe doing some Google searches on ROS, you'll sometimes see Catkin. Uh, don't get confused. It's nothing like, it's not like another, it, it's basically just a, the ROS one build system. Um, also a robot system can be extremely complex uh, that runs tens, if not hundreds of nodes. And the way to coordinate these running of, of, large handful of nodes is through a launch system or launch files. In ROS1, uh, ROS1 uses an XML-based uh, script to coordinate the launching of the various nodes. In ROS2, uh, it uses a Python-based launch script. Again, I mention this because I, I find it's important because as you're researching or Google searching various uh, ways to implement your robot system, uh, if you come across ROS1, launch files, um, you'll, know, you'll, you'll know that it's, it's a launch file because it looks like XML. There are other differences as well. Um, you could Google search uh, the differences, but in my opinion, these are the most salient ones. Okay, any questions? Next slide. So we'll be focusing on ROS2 for the remainder of this workshop. What we'll be doing is creating a ROS2, then a subscriber node. We'll publish some messages uh, to these nodes that we create well, over some prescribed ch uh, topic channels that we also define. We'll also learn how to use some of the ROS2 command line tools to help us understand the ROS2 system that's running. And uh, be before we move on, um, how is everyone doing in terms of understanding? Is uh, everyone caught up? Is it totally confusing. Uh, I like to do this during the workshops. If you can type into the chat uh, from one to five, where one is I'm totally confused, five is I totally get it, three is kind of like I'm kind of following along, but 50% uh, uh, is Greek to me. What, what it, where is everyone at right now? Three, three, five, okay. <laughs> Four-ish. I think a four four point nine five, right? <laughs> All right, great. Um, so for the remainder of the workshop, well, also to try to keep everyone in sync. Um, well, actually, Carlotta, uh, are we going to use breakout rooms this time since we have a couple of other TAs for the coding sessions, or should we just all try to stay together? 
I am fine either way. I can make breakout rooms, but let's see how many TAs are comfortable um, TAing a, a breakout room, but, and then I'll know how many to make. So maybe poll Sophia and Simeon and Jasmine and Kat and see how many breakout rooms I should create. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, part of it is also, um, I'm not sure if all the TAs have the Hatterbox system um, installed, but uh, you know, I'm more than happy to just also have everyone in one room and try to lockstep it in that way. The, the number of participants isn't, um, isn't unwieldy. I think it's about seven or something like that. Okay. We don't have, we don't have to have that many. I don't know if we need breakouts. I also sometimes have technical issues with, right? I mean, like I do this a couple times a week, but sometimes if you close them out and they kick me out, it's weird. Uh, but what we might want to do is just have zone TAs. So like, I don't know, two or three people pick a TA and that way you know exactly who you can talk to and you can DM people. Oh, I like it. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so um, before we start, uh, we had asked every all the participants to install the software stack. Uh, hopefully that has all been created. Um, if you have not installed the software stack, you can still follow along. Uh, you just, it'll be very difficult to actually compile and run some of the examples, but uh, you can still follow along and at least understand some of the concepts. Um, is there any, any participant here who has not had a chance to install the uh, software stack? Or better yet, let me ask, uh, is, does everyone have it up and running right now? And basically the series of commands that are, that are listed on the, on the slide deck. Um, I, I, <laughs> I just tried to get my up and running and I'm stuck in the long uh, HTTP <laughs> local host as usual. That's kind of like what I experienced the last time. Uh, but I want to see if I can uh, get it to be the, to get to the point where I can click on that link and go. But I was able to get it work yesterday. I was going to say maybe Zone, Cat, and Shioma together, Jack, so you can keep teaching. That might be good. Okay, uh, fair, fair enough. And also, like, after the workshop, if you need help getting it up and running, um, and you can work asynchronously on your own through the examples. I'm more than happy to help as well. So, but uh, as um, Carlotta mentioned, uh, let's keep moving forward then. Next slide. Let us, using the, um, if your Hadabot software stack is up and running, you can, if you can click through this link to open up the browser based. Visual Studio Code. Um, so I should probably mention the reason. One of the main reasons why we want to use the Hadabot software stack is it has a built-in development environment uh, set up with ROS in the software stack. And as you all know, the software stack is really uh, it's just a, a set of Docker containers which have been pre-configured to make um, learning a little bit easier because it is pretty complicated. Um, sometimes ROS setup can be pretty complicated. Uh, when people have that web page pulled up, uh, if you can do a plus one in your in the chat, that'll be great. We haven't. I know, Kat, that's uh, one of the things we should probably talk about in in uh, making more streamlined. But we need to get a chance to this time. It looks like most people are good. Uh, cool. All right, one, two. We're, we're looking for seven people, I think, right? How many plus ones are we looking for? Oh, one, one, two, two three, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, but uh, Ch Chilma, is that right? Did I get your name right? Chilma can't, is uh, not able to get it up and running yet. So we're- Yes, yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll help her. We'll get there. Okay. So I think for now, I'm, I'm looking for six plus ones. I think we're good to go. Uh, all right, let me find my window here. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so to prep to do some coding, um, we're going to do the following. We're gonna open up a, in the VS code window, we're gonna open up a terminal. And to do that, you right click the Hadabot underscore WS folder to your left and select 
open in terminal. And once you have that terminal window open, you want to type the source command that's, uh, that's printed out on the, um, on the slide deck. And omit the dollar sign. The dollar sign is just to indicate that it's a terminal command. Uh, so don't, don't type the dollar sign in. And for the sake of simplicity and time here, I'm actually just going to paste it into the chat for those who want to cut and paste directly, go for it. I don't encourage this usually when you're learning on your own. I, um, there's something about typing stuff out that allows you to learn stuff a little bit better. But uh, again, for the sake of time, um, we'll cheat and do cut and paste it when, when necessary for the remainder of the workshop. Okay, why don't you do a plus one whenever you get that set up? Three, four, five. All right. One more. Great. All right. Next slide, please, Carlotta. Okay. Um, let's open the file that we want to uh, edit. And uh, it should be pretty self explanatory. If you left click through those series of folders, you'll get to the file that you want, which is m01 underscore node underscore pi dot pi. I'm going to do the same here myself. Plus one when you get that up. Uh, I think we are good to go. Next slide, please, Carlotta. In this file, you will see a small block of code that um, is kind of a placeholder uh, called uh, add time error callback code below. Replace it with the highlighted code in the block underneath. And again, for the sake of time, I am going to cut and paste this into the chat. There's one thing to note. Um, the first line is not indented properly. And if you recall in Python, you need to indent properly. So just indent that. If you use the cut and paste, just make sure that piece of uh, that first line is indented. And Kat, I know we got to think of a better way to do this cut and paste process. Yep. All right. So plus one, whenever you guys have that, paste it into your paste it into your um, your file here. Sorry, I'm cutting and pasting and talking at the same time. And don't forget to control S to save the file. Cool, we got Brian. Waiting on two more two more people. If there's a problem, feel free to ping one of the TAs. All right. Next slide, please, Colada. Now we're gonna build the the code. If you go to your terminal uh, at in the um, the panel. In the bottom panel, uh, you basically wrote source opt ross foxy setup dot bash. Um, oh, wait a and the indentation gets messed up. Uh, okay, so Paria, maybe you could ping one of the TAs to sort of uh, QA it, um, QA your indentation issues. It shouldn't get messed up. There is the editor itself is set up to do some linting. So if anything, it should correct it for you, but it shouldn't screw it up, but um, maybe something else is going on. 
But we're going to keep going on, Perea. Okay. Um, hopefully, I pronounced your name correctly. So let's build the um, the system by to or build the file or node that you just uh, augmented. From the terminal, type in call con build as you see in the deck. And do a plus one whenever you're whenever you're ready. It should build. This should say two packages finished. Um, without any errors. Sweet. All right. So, um, Hamid, I think you need to. So did you do the source opt Ross Foxy setup that bash? I mean, oh, cool. Paria is up to speed. Cool. I think, uh, we're still waiting on three. How's everyone else doing? <laughs> okay, four. Are we, are we waiting for anyone else? Thank God. Brian. Still building. Okay. Should take about, I think, 10 seconds max, depending. There's a minute left, huh? One of the downsides of using Docker is speed, depending on what system you use. Sometimes it could take a little longer. Okay. Well, for those time period was not declared in this scope. Uh... Yeah, so you got to cut and paste. So Paria, you got to cut and paste the time period in sec. Let me try again here. I'll cut and paste this in. Can I see your screen with the code on it? I just want to check to see if I inserted it in the right. Does, uh, does everyone have uh, the slides in front of them? Just in case you do get backed up. Uh, it, it's helpful to have the slides there just in case you want to copy and paste from there. So I'm going to put them in the chat. And it might help everyone just to have them open. So if like if you if you you know if something goes wrong, you can kind of page back a little bit, and and give it another shot. So Jack or Cat, did you want to show your code? I stopped sharing, or do you want me to go back to sharing? I think if we share, it's it's uh it'll be it'll be apparent in the slide. Okay, so you, you want me to put up the slides, or do you want to share your code? I'll just uh, put up the slides again, and we'll go okay. go back to where we were before. Okie dokie, give me just a second to get him back. No problem. Let me know when you've got him back. Okay, we see them. And if you want to go to this, the slide before this one. Yeah. So for those who have, are having trouble compiling make sure the indentation is accurate compared to the bottom block of code that is printed out on the slide. And this is also, um, you can also reference this in the link, in the slide link that Kat pasted in the chat. So that is what slide 17, 18? Yeah, 18. So, Peria, I think you. What happened is your timer period in sec was not either not pasted in, or it's pasted in with the wrong indentation. I'm gonna try this. Hold on. 
I wonder if I add, if I add a space, it's just, it's no, it's still, it always kills my first, um, my first indentation for some reason. All right, let me try this, hold on, uh, cut and paste. Ah, oh, better, okay. <laughs> So now technically, if you cut and paste that into your window, it should, into your file, it should just work. Obviously don't include the cut and paste that I wrote. <laughs> okay, well, um, hopefully we'll, we'll pause, we'll pause in a sec to get everyone to catch up. But for those who have caught up, um, we built a system. I think we got a couple of plus ones who said that they've built their ROS package or ROS workspace correctly. We'll talk more about workspaces in a bit. Um, let's continue on and type in the next command into your terminal. That's uh, so you wrote Kawcon build. You had a bunch of uh, you. you it, the Kawcon has outputted that your ROS files have been successfully built. Now type this into your terminal command. And we'll explain what all these sourcings do in a bit. For now, just type and follow. Plus one when you get that typed in. Oh, right, next slide, please. Sorry, the, that Carlotta, forgot to mention it. So right now we are on the second highlight, second highlighted command in the deck. Uh, your, once you call com build your system, uh, type in source install setup.bash. As a, we got two plus ones. What about Brian? Brian Trista. Still building. Okay. Well, for those who, um, for those who have successfully sort, built and source install set up that bash to your system, um, you can type in the third command. I will cut and paste it into the chat. And we'll talk more about what this command does in a bit. But once you type that in, you should see some ROS code being executed. The same in my system here. Okay, so let's see, Brian. So Brian, um, the CPP node will be built. There is another CPP node. Uh, I use the same source for, for um, the C++ version of these lessons, but it shouldn't take more than 10, maybe 20 seconds. I assume it's taking much, much longer for you. Is that right? Or better yet, um, maybe one of the TAs, if you want to give Brian a help. As a matter of fact, uh, if you are having trouble at this point, um, maybe type it into the chat and we'll pair you up with a TA to get you up to speed. Does that sound like a plan? Okay. So There's Brian... not a lot we can do about long builds. Uh, we might just have to give a pause here. Give a pause. Okay. Eight minutes is a long time though. Yeah. There's something, something smells fishy. 
Yeah. Can you, can you give me uh, machine stats? Just and I ask mainly just so we can understand what's causing people problems. Okay, I think um, we have two two machine hanging participants and four who have things up and running. Uh, maybe for the people who have machine particip the the participants who have who are still building, um, if you wanted to take a TA of your choice, um, ping them with what is currently being printed out uh, during your build output right now. And then you guys can base. Okay, Brian's good. Um, yeah, Krista, I think uh, you know maybe if you could cut and paste to Cat what your current terminal looks like, she could give you a hand. And we'll just move on, and Cat will get you caught up. Cool. All right. So I assume all the all the participants who plus one had their um, ROS to run command be successful, and they see hello from the Hadabot ROS2 intro Python node be printed out once a second on their terminal screen. Please flag if that is not the case for those who have plus one. Great. Um, then for now, uh, let's stop the program. Um, you have uh, successfully built your first ROS2 node. Um, let's stop the program. We'll talk a little bit about how everything's working. So hit control C everybody. For those, uh, not everybody, but for, for those who have uh, successfully completed the ROS2 run command. And Carlotta, if we could do the next slide, please, that'd be great. All right, so what did we just do? Um, I'm not seeing any output, but I would check that now. Okay, so uh, Timothy, if you wanted to ping one of the TAs, um, I'm going to move forward for the sake of time. But uh, I think basically it's just about rerunning it and knowing where to look. Um, so back to the presentation or the workshop. Before we worked on anything ROS2 related, we needed to do some prep work for our system environment. Specifically, if you remember, the first thing we did was um, run this source opt ROS foxy set up that bash command. Um, this source command sets up the environment for our bash terminal so that we can work on ROS2 stuff. This includes setting up the path and environment variables so that the system can find the command line tools um, for ROS, such as the ROS2 command line tool that you've been that you have typed in, as well as all the libraries you need to compile and run the ROS2 programs. The source command sets up what ROS specifically calls, and this is ROS nomenclature, it's called the underlay. It is the underlying environment variables for the core installed ROS libraries and tools. And in our case, for the Fox release of ROS2. This, uh, for a slide that's predominantly empty, uh, there's a lot of information, any questions? Okay, um, Kat, I know I hear you typing away furiously. Are we caught up? Should we keep going or you think we should just wait? Some of this, these concepts are actually pretty, uh, probably pretty important for I the would, other. I, I would keep. Oh, Kat, you're on mute. Sorry, I would, I would keep going, I think. Okay. I got All right, so we'll keep going. Uh, Carlotta, next slide, please. So as you deduced, um, CawCon is the build to build our ROS2 programs. Um, how does CawCon know what to build? You basically call this from the Hadabot underscore WS directory and some stuff magically happened. Um, well, first off, the Hadabot WS folder, this is another ROS nomenclature here, it's called the ROS2 workspace. A workspace consists of a bunch of, a bunch of ROS packages. And for us specifically, we have two ROS packages. They are, um, they are all listed under the source directory. 
We have one ROS package called M01 package pi for a bunch of Python nodes. We have another one called M01 package underscore CPP for a number of C++ nodes. The inside each one of these package folders, there are some metadata and source files that help tell the ROS2 system to know what to compile and how to compile and how to set up the package. When Kalkon successfully built, it adds two additional directories, the build and the install directory, where it puts the post-built binaries and libraries and other system scripts that have been outputted. So far, so good? No. So in summary, Hadabot underscore WS is the workspace. Packages, when you call Kalkon from the workspace directory, it looks under the source directory for all the packages listed under the source directory and it'll build them one at a time. Inside each package, there, are, there includes not only your source files, but additional meta, meta files to describe how the packages should be built, how they should be set up, and how should they be installed. When Kalkon is done building everything, it puts all the outputs and libraries and setup files in this build and install folder. Okay. Next slide, please. Oh, some of the arrows are gone. Huh. Is okay. Something wrong, Jack? Uh, in the deck, you have, for some reason, it's missing some arrows, but I think that's okay. Wait a minute. Uh, okay, it's not this slide, right? No, it is that slide. You're you're good. Um, don't worry. It's okay. It's all good. Uh, okay. So, um, the first primary source command uh, sets up the underlay. Um, that's, uh, so we, we talked about the underlay. There is also a concept called overlays in ROS2. The first command sets up the underlay uh, from your Hadabot workspace directory. After you called callcom build, you did another source command. This sets up the overlay. And the overlay are the environment variables and paths for the ROS2 components that you just compiled inside your Hadabot workspace that you're working on. Is that, um, is, is anyone have any questions about the overlay and underlay so far? So the new set of environment variables that you've been, that you set up um, with, the, with the source install setup.bash command, that allows your system to know where to find the nodes and programs that you just built. So um, Hamid, Hamid asked the question, is source opt ROS Foxy setup bash, is that for the underlay? No, that's actually for the, yes, that is for the underlay. That's correct. That's for the underlay. Um, I paused for a bit because in, in a slide deck that I had modified, there was an arrow pointing from the command to the underlay, but apparently uh, the, the version that Carlotta has, hasn't been updated with that. Um, actually, Carlotta, can you go to the next slide, please? It's the slide after. Yeah, there we go. So in the slide, uh, the first line, the source op ROS Foxy setup, that sets up the underlay, the box underneath. Then you're gonna, then you wrote some code, then you built a system. And then this, the last or the second source install setup that bash that sets up the overlay and that tells the system where all the files that you built go. Does that answer your question, Hamid? Okay, any other questions about overlays and underlays? Okay, well, we're gonna, next slide please, Carlotta. So, um, to make more matters, to make matters even more confusing, you can actually have multiple layers of overlays. So say your team was iteratively improving a Terminator robot. The underlay sets up the ROS2 Foxy libraries and tools. Next slide, Carlotta. Then say you want to pull in the T800 improvements done in the past by some other dev team. 
Um, you basically go to the work T T800 workspace, you build a workspace or the packages in that workspace, and you set up the overlay for the T800 um, improvements. And then you could do the same for the T1000 improvements, and you set up the overlay on top of that. And lastly, Carlotta, next slide. You, so lastly, you would take your current improvements to the Terminator robot, and you would build your improvements or the packages that implement your improvements, and you would set up the overlay on top of all the previous overlays that you set that, that were already sourced. So with this layering design of various overlays that sits on one fundamental ROS underlay, you can inherit incremental improvements made from past dev development efforts in a modular and shareable manner. So Hamid, hopefully this adds some more color to your question. Any other questions? Uh, one thing for people who've used Python a lot, like one analogy that kind of works is virtual environments, right? So like uh, in Python, if you create a virtual environment, you just like, oh, I only install stuff in here and whatever I install in here stays in here. It's kind of like a pod or a firewall around your code. And then sometimes what you can do with the overlay um, is just say, well, now I'm going to add this thing on top of it and then this thing on top of it. And so it's just kind of a way of keeping everything separate and clean. It is it is very confusing. So if you don't get it right away, that's that's when I don't even get it half the time. But it's basically a way of stacking up software. Thanks for the thanks for that, Kat. Um, how are we doing on getting the uh, the participants who had some build issues up to speed? Um, is it uh, caught up? Should I pause? Should I? I think we're roughly caught up. I, I haven't heard anything from anyone, so. Okay. Um, so let's see, I'm trying to figure out when I should pause to ask my, is everyone confused question? Maybe we'll go on for a little bit more and then I'll ask in a bit. All right, next slide, Carlotta. So back to the um, back to the the what we've been doing before. Uh, after we set up the overlay for our Hadabot workspace, we called this ROS2 command on our uh, in our terminal. And this ROS2 command is is the main ROS is the main command line interface for ROS2. We're going to explore a little bit more about what what ROS2 what this ROS2 CLI does in a bit. But for this particular ROS2 run command that we've um, that we've kicked off, it it basically is a command to execute your ROS2 program, hence um, start your ROS2 node that you compiled. It takes two parameters. The first parameter is the package name of where your ROS2 program is going to be, and the second one is the the second parameter is the actual ROS2 program. So hopefully that's clear. Okay, next slide, please. And before we dive into the specifics of the code, um, we should also talk a little bit more about what a ROS2 program encompasses. So regardless of whatever language you use to program ROS2, it will consist of four main parts. Your ROS2 program will consist of four main parts. The first one is some sort of initialization of your ROS2 program. Um, the second one is some instantiation or creation of your node object, your ROS2 node object. Then you're going to put your node in some sort of infinite loop. And this is generally called a ROS spin loop. And each iteration of this loop will cause one of the following activities to occur, or one or more of the following activities to occur. One would be a timer-driven activity, such as publishing a camera image every, every 10 10 milliseconds or so. Or it could be processing of an event-driven activity, such as, oh, I got a camera image. I need to do something with it. Finally, um, we need to shut down the ROS2 program in a graceful manner. And this is usually this usually occurs with some sort of like control C um, command that occurs. And uh, this helps clean up the ROS2 system. And uh, it also breaks it out of this ROS2 spin infinite loop. So, Depending on what language you use to implement your ROS2 program, the syntax will be slightly different, but the general flow 
will be exactly as you see above. Okay, next slide, please. So let's map that that ROS2 life of a ROS2 program to the code that we've uh, that we've well to the file that we modified. If you look in that m01 node underscore pi dot pi file, you'll notice a main function. In that main function, you will see a uh, initialization, the initialization step. This initialization step is uh, is is uh, kicked off by calling uh, rclpy.init. rclpy is the main Python library for ROS. It actually stands for ROS client library for Python. The rclpy library implements all the ROS2 Python interface routines needed to program ROS2. If you were coding in C++, you'll be using a rclcpp library. Um, the second part of the program is the instantiation of the node. And here you see my ROS node being instantiated. The third is to put this node in some sort of in a spin loop, infinite spin loop, which is done by calling the spin function. And lastly, um, so the, 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 your node basically hangs in this loop infinitely. But when you hit control C, or there's some sort of exit event that occurs, the, the next following lines of code will be called, and that's basically the shutdown or the cleanup routines, which is to destroy the node as well as um, officially shut down ROS. Okay, so hopefully we, we talked about before the, um, the life of a ROS2 program. Here is that life of a ROS2 program mapped to the actual code that's written in, one, in the file that you've augmented. Uh, next slide, please. So I think Krista has a question in the chat. Uh, huh. Yeah, Kat, maybe you could help her with that or help him. I'm sorry, Trista is uh, not sure. Apologize if I had the gender incorrectly. That sounds funny, 205 nodes. Um, yeah, it's still going. <laughs> 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 okay. I'm at 462, uh, 463. Sounds like it sounds like you maybe built something in the wrong directory. So I'll let me I'll I'll DM you. Let's figure this out. That might have that might actually be what's going on. Yeah, yeah, Trista might be building the entire NAV stack, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is, it, is that the timestamp that's printing in front of the hello from the head of bot uh message? Oh, that could be. Uh, yeah, you know, um, Trista, why don't you cut and paste what your terminal says to Kat, and then she'll get you squared away. That's a good idea. That's a good possibility. Uh, okay, let's see here. Okay, we're at the right slide. So um, looking again at the top of the m01 node pi.py file, you'll see the block of code that actually implements your ROS2 node. Um, the ROS2 node is called my ROS node. It is created as a ROS2 node simply by inheriting this, um, this rclpy.node.node object. In its constructor, the, you, call, you first call the parent constructor, and it's what you pass in is the name of the node. In this case, it's intro ROS2 node underscore pi. And we'll, uh, we'll actually see, we'll use the ROS2, the CLI uh, command line to uh, double check that later on in the exercise. Uh, we also, for the code, the green block of code that you cut and pasted or typed in, that is the timer driven activity that you've created for your ROS2 node. And what that does is it basically tells you to call the timer callback once a second. And in the timer callback, it's uh, not too glamorous here. All it does is it outputs out a, uh, a simple debug message. Okay. And this happens once a second. Basically, as you're spinning, as you're in that spin loop, once a second, there's a timer based activity. And that timer based activity, as we've implemented, um, deep dumps out a debug message in that uh, for that one callback. Okay. All right. Uh, moving on. 
Next slide, please. Great. So um, let's. We've been talking about this ROS2 CLI command for a little bit, and I even promised to say that you will be using this command to double check some of the uh, known names, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let's play around with it a little bit. Um, and to do this, if we go back to our to our Visual Studio browser-based Visual Visual Studio Code environment, let's create a second terminal. And to do that, there is a plus button next to the drop down menu which you can click and it'll create another bash terminal and uh, once everyone has that and you can select which bash terminal you want by using the drop down so you can select one and two one should be the original terminal that you use to build and run the node and two is the new terminal let's uh, stick on the second terminal that we just created um, people want to give me a plus one when they got their second terminal uh, created and uh, up and running in front of them. Okay. I think that's quorum. Cat, uh, next slide, please. I mean, not cat. Carlotta, next slide, please. All right. So. In the first terminal, let's select the first terminal again. Let's run our node uh, with the command up above. It's the same command that you that you previously run, but I'll cut and paste it into the into the chat window. Or you could just use the up arrow enter to get the, the last previous command that you used. And in this um, you should again see the hello from the Hadabot ROS2 intro Python node being printed out once a second. After you get that working, select the second bash terminal. So use the drop down menu, select bash number two, colon bash. And from there, you want to set up your underlay by typing in the source command. Um, if you refer back to the slide deck, you'll see the source opt ROS foxy setup.bash that you need to type in. I'll also cut and paste that into the chat. Um, and once everybody has that underlay set up for your second bash terminal, you want to give me a plus one. Haria, I think you forgot a space in between source and the first forward slash. Thank you. Okay. Well, for those who have um, completed the setting up of the underlay, um, let us type in the second command in the slide deck, which is ROS2 node list. I'll cut and paste that into the, into the chat as well. Okay. And um, please, for those who have successfully done that, you should see two, two entries listed, one of which says intro ROS2 node pi. Uh, if you have ROS2 node list successfully executed, um, maybe do a plus one. Okay. Well, um, for those who have completed it, 
Uh, I assume you've confirmed that you see the intro underscore ROS2 underscore node underscore pi listed out as one of the nodes. Um, if you recall, the in the code that we wrote, the parent class was um, initialized with the same string name. And that is the name of your ROS node. And what this ROS2 node list command does is it uses this ROS2 CLI to list all the nodes running in your ROS2 system right now, of which one of them is your intro ROS2 node underscore pi node. I'm gonna pause here. Does this make sense to everyone? Is everyone um, sort of caught up? I'm gonna do my one to five question again. Uh, one is I'm totally confused. Five is uh, I'm totally caught up. Three is I'm kind of getting it. Maybe three is like, I get it, but I can't run the code for some reason. If you want to type in four, okay. Three. Cool. All right. So, um, Shoma, you know, you feel free to use the chat to ping any of the TAs with any questions uh, that help you bump up your score a little bit. And of course, uh, you know, after after this uh, session, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, all right, let's see, where were we here? Uh, let's try another ROS2 command uh, in the deck. You'll see the next one, which is which I'll cut and paste into the uh, into the chat here. And what this command will do is give us some more information about specifically about our intro ROS2 node pi node. It dumps out a couple of various um, various information, if you will. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about what it dumps out. I think the takeaway from this exercise is to know that ROS2 is a powerful command line tool which allows you to introspect your ROS2 system. And as your system, as your ROS2 robotic system gets more complicated, you feel free to lean on this ROS2. Um, this ROS2 CLI to figure out how nodes are connected, what they're doing, what kind of, what nodes are running. Uh, and uh, at any time, you can always type ROS2 dash dash help, and it'll give you a list of all the commands that you, uh, that are available to you. So not only can you use it to look at um, node information, but you, if you typed in ROS2 dash dash help, you'll notice that it has commands for um, launching nodes, for parameters, for packages, um, for topics and messages, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. All right. Next slide, please. So um, congratulations, you just implemented your first ROS2 node and interacted it with interacted with it using the ROS2 CLI. Uh, and we're going to move on now to, uh, to implement some ROS2 capabilities. Um, we're going to start fresh with another with another full with another VS code environment. I'm going to cut and paste this link to help you get kicked off to help that environment get kicked off. So uh, you, if you wanted to open another tab on your browser and cut and paste that link in, um, please go ahead and do so. Next slide, please, Carlotta. Um, in, as with the previous coding example, um, well, as with any time you work on any sort of ROS, uh, you want to set up the underlay. So open up a terminal by right-clicking Hadabot underscore WS, open a terminal, and type in, set up your underlay by typing in the source command that is, that is printed out on the slide deck. And I'll cut and paste the command in as well into the chat. Uh, 
Uh, oh, good question, Trista. Should you should you stop the other environment? Um, yeah. Why don't we do that? So uh, you should just if you if you go, I think you just close the browser window, or um, you know what? Um, go back to your first terminal and Control C out of the uh, the node. Uh, some of you, it sounds like some of your uh, systems are already being pushed to the limit. So this will help free up some CPU cycles. So control, go back to your original, um, go back to the, the browser tab from your original example, select the first batch terminal, hit control C to make sure you're out of the program. Then you actually can even just close the browser tab. I believe that will release the memory and CPU cycle, cycles associated with that, um, that environment. All right, cool. Uh, so back to ROS2 topics, we set up the underlay and next slide, Carlotta. Let's look for the following M02 subscriber underscore pi dot pi file. And again, it's just uh, clicking through the Explorer window to look for the necessary source file. And when you have that open, um, replace the, the stubbed block of code, highlighted code, with the highlighted code, which I will cut and paste into the chat. And it's, it's basically a cut and paste of the, the second highlighted code underneath. Uh, I'm trying to get this indentation right in the chat here. Here we go. I believe that should work if you just cut and paste it in. If you cut and paste from the chat into your into the, the, the file. Okay, uh, plus one when you have that added into your source code. Okay, next slide, Carlotta. Okay, so same thing as last time. Let's uh, build the file uh, in the terminal that you ran. Uh, you've already set up the underlay. Uh, just type in call con build. And then once you have built the file successfully, there shouldn't be any errors. Set up the overlay by typing in the source command the source install set up that bash command. So just to know, uh, the source command, just assume you, you'll do it. You'll Once you use ROS for a while, you, it'll just become like automatic. It's the biggest thing I see new users stumble on. And it's just like, just always source it. And all you're doing is you're saying, hey, I'm going to be using this version of ROS. Set everything up for me. And so you just do it like instinctually anytime you open a new terminal. It's like a, the wax on, wax off move. You do it so much, just becomes natural. Uh, okay, and last but not least, let's run the node that we compiled. So you set up your, let's see, in summary, we set up the underlay, we've built the workspace, you set up the overlay with the source install setup.bash, and now I will cut and paste the ROS2 run command into the chat. When, um, when you successfully run the this new ROS node, you should see um, printed out Python node waiting for a ROS2 message. And when you do so, if you could type in plus one into the chat, that'd be great. Cool. 
Still Billy. <laughs> All right. So Paria, Paria we're, we're going to keep moving forward for the sake of time, but uh, hopefully you go get caught up. Um, let's not hit control C, keep the program running. And Carlotta, next slide, please. So we're going to use the ROS2 CLI again. Uh, and as with the last example, we're going to open another bash terminal to do so. So click the plus arrow um, next to that drop down menu, and you, you should see a two bash created. And uh, let's see here. Right, a two bash created. And next slide, Carlotta. We're gonna set up the overlay again. The is what Kat mentioned, just very naturally do the do the sourcing of the of the raw setup.bash. I'll type it in the terminal for those who don't want to type. So this sets up the underlay to work on ROS2 for your new two bash terminal. And once you have the underlay set up. We're going to use the, I'm going to type, type into the chat, the ROS2 CLI command, which we'll, which we'll be using. Now feel free to cut and paste. It's very, it's quite verbose. Uh, and type that into your two bash. All right, uh, plus one, whenever you have that, that uh, ROS2 topic pub command executed. We'll talk more about this command in a bit, by the way. So um, fear not, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of letters. Okay, two, how's uh, three? I think we're waiting for Timothy. And hopefully Perea is done building. Okay. All right, we're going to move forward. Um, so those who have successfully run the ROS2 topic pub command, if you select back to the first bash, you should see a new debug message printed out. And it should say ROS2 message received by Python node. Hello from Hadabot. If it's not the case, um, flag us in the terminal, but I'll assume that that is uh, what you guys see. Um, Carlotta, next slide, please. So um, what just happened here? Now, as we mentioned in the overview section of ROS2, ROS in general is based on this publisher subscriber architecture. This pub, pub sub pattern has nothing to do with robotics. It is just one way to design complex software systems to enforce modularity. Regardless of ROS1 or ROS2, um, let's go back and review some of the uh, ROS2 terminologies for PubSub again, um, just so that we can uh, have that fresh in our heads. ROS2 messages are serialized data bundles that is transmitted from one ROS node to another. Topics are the wires or the channels that where the through which the messages pass through. The subscribers are the ones at one end of the wire that receive the messages. Publishers are at the other end of the wire that transmit and publish out the messages over the topic, that is, the topic wire. So <clears throat> as hinted in this diagram, um, you can see that you can actually have multiple subscribers to a single topic. So it's not a one-to-one -one deal here. Um, a camera image topic 
can have multiple subscribers to it depending on what the node does. Okay, so far so good. Next slide, please. When a sub subscriber or publisher is created, it needs to specify the message type or the structure of the message. In other words, the message that flows through the topic wire, it cannot be unstructured. You cannot just say, oh, I'm going to pass any data through the topic and it's going to be arbitrary data. One minute it's going to be a float and then I'm going to change it to a string. It has to be structured. So you have to specify what the message type for this topic will be. There are a number of core message types defined for you by Ross. So when you set up the um, underlay, um, what's provided for you are a bunch of standard messages such as a string or a float. Um, there are actually standard, more complicated standard messages that Ross defined for you for uh, standard robotics applications such as the image that provided for you when you set up the underlay. The best practice is to use uh, the core Ross messages types, the core message, the core Ross message types whenever possible, because you want to ensure that the packages that you implement are shareable with others. And uh, uh, when people use standard types, that helps enforce the shareability of multiple packages, right? Because you're talking the same language effectively. Um, you, if you cannot find a core message type defined by Ross that fits your needs, Ross does allow you to define your own message type. Well, um, we won't be doing that in the workshop today, but there are tutorials online that will allow you to will tell you how to do so. Okay. Next slide. Um, going back to the code that we that we've augmented um, in the constructor, you'll notice there's one single line of code that helps create your subscriber. And that's using a create subscription routine, which is inherited uh, when you inherit the parent RCL node.node class. This create subscription routine takes in a couple of parameters. The first parameter it takes is the message type. In our case, it's the standard messages string message type. So if you remember from the previous slide, when we create a subscriber or publisher for a particular topic, we, it can, cannot be unstructured. We have to tell, tell Ross what type we care about for this specific topic that we're subscribing or publishing to. The second parameter is a character string um, that defines the topic channel or that, uh, yeah, that defines the topic channel. It's, the, it's the, uh, the name of the wire or the phone number, if you will. That's the topic name. And in our case, it's my subtopic, not a very innovative name. And the third parameter is the callback routine that gets invoked when the message is received by the subscriber. Lastly, the 10, um, apologize for the magic number here, but uh, that for those who don't know what magic number is, magic numbers are in, in uh, when you program, you have these just these random numbers around. Um, the best practice would be to assign a variable name to the number and use the variable name rather than just the number itself. But um, this 10 here, for, this, uh, for the sake of um, just um, making the, the code a little bit smaller, this 10 here describes the depth of the queue of which we hold incoming messages. So there are cases where the passing of the messages, where the messages are published faster than you can consume. This queue allows you to hold and buffer some of those messages up. So you're, you're, you can get at least the, the last um, the last couple of uh, the the late the latest messages that have been published, is that correct, Cat? So it's like a, I think it's first in first out, right? So the the what stays in the queue are always the latest messages. I think that's. I believe in most cases there might be some subtlety when we start talking about like quality of service and stuff, but oh, I think right. that's I think that's a pretty good model to. I mean, you're, you'll be in a pretty sophisticated situation if you're super worried about this stuff. So I wouldn't worry about it initially. Okay, yeah. So uh, uh, the takeaway is there's some queue. It helps prevent the case where um, you're, you're not consuming the messages fast enough, um, faster than the publishers can publish. 
Uh, last but not least, the uh, listener callback in our case is not too fancy. All it does is it dumps out a debug message, which you saw in the CLI example before. Uh, any questions so far uh, about topics? Oh, Trista had this card. So Trista, yes, you're supposed to delete the pass. But any questions in general about the um, about topics? Okay, next slide, please, Carlotta. So with our, well, in the example that we ran in the first bash terminal, we had our subscriber node running in the background, waiting for a message on my subtopic, the topic channel. In the second bash terminal, we used the ROS2 topic pub command to publish a specific message. Um, to this message command, this publishing command takes a number of parameters as described above. Uh, it's one of the more verbose um, subcommands that you can invoke. The first, uh, the first parameter is a minus one, which is a shorthand for just telling Ross that I want to publish this message once. You can come, you can have Ross to topic pub publish it, publish messages um, con continuously at a certain frequency. But for our use case, we only wanted to publish it once. Um, the next parameter is the topic name. And um, this should be uh, familiar, my underscore sub underscore topic. That was the name of the topic that we wrote in our code. The next parameter is the message type. In our case, it's the standard message is string. And lastly, it's the, uh, the payload. What you, what, what's the data that you want to bundle up to send to the, to the subscribers? And in this case, it's, uh, it's a string that, uh, um, that specifies hello from Hadabot. If you go back to the example and you change the hello from Hadabot to something else, hello from, from Black and Robotics, you'll know, you will see the subscriber print out the respective change. The, um, it's worth noting that this payload is a JSON slash XML, is in some sort of JSON slash XML like form. It is verbose, um, and there is uh, if you if you mess up the way of formatting this data, the pub command will not execute correctly. Um, for the sake of time and uh, reduce the scope of uh, of this workshop, we won't go into how to make sure this payload is is um, authored correctly. But know that you have to be pretty accurate how you describe this the, what what's in the quotes, the payload, if you will. The um, the topic pub is a subcommand of the topic command. <laughs> Head whirling. <laughs> you can get you can figure out what other subcommands there are by top of that are underneath the topic command by typing in ROS2 topic help. You can figure out. If you won't know you want to use the pub subcommand, you could get more information about what are the parameters are, are what parameters you can use by typing in ROS2 topic pub help. And this could be generalized. You can do it for any subcommand for the topic command. Okay. Hopefully it's self-explanatory as printed out. Next slide, please, Carlotta. So to cap off um, some more messing around with the ROS2 CLI, um, if you wanted to go back to your second bash, uh, we should still have our subscriber node running in the first bash. That's still running. We never controlled C. So hopefully that's the case for you still. In the second bash, if you wanted to type in ROS2 topic list, that is another topic subcommand that we can invoke. Uh, I paste that into the chat for you to cut and paste if you like. So don't forget to select the second bash to bash before you run this ROS2 topic list. If you run that subcommand, the list subcommand, you'll see my subtopic 
listed as one of the topics in your ROS2 system. And you can use another command, subcommand called info, as I cut and paste it into the chat, to get more information about your my subtopic topic. You'll notice that it prints out the type, um, the message type for this particular topic. Uh, the publisher count, which should be zero because we only running the subscriber and the subscription count was one. And as Kat wrote in the chat, the dash dash help is always your friend. If you went in doubt, um, you can use dash dash help to figure out either what the command does or what the sub command does. And if you do ROS2 dash dash help, you can even get a list of all the commands of which you'll see topic listed. Okay. Any questions? So I'm going to pause here for another one of my uh, one to five questions. One totally confused, five up to speed, five totally get it, um, three somewhere in the middle. How's everyone doing? I mean, you were five, now you're four ish. <laughs> Jack, I have a question. Yes. So if, if we wanted to publish this message twice or like once every second, where do we change that? Is it inside the definition of the uh, topic or the way we're calling this function in the back? Uh, if you wanted, to, if you're doing it from the CLI, which is, I assume is the, uh, the what you're asking, um, you would modify the minus one parameter to something else. And this is a great exercise. If you just do ROS2 topic pub dash dash help, you should find that information and it will tell you how to publish a message at a particular frequency. Now I'm gonna do it myself. There's a minus R or dash dash rate to specify at what frequency you wanna publish a particular message. Got it. Thanks. Yep. Good question. So dash dash help. It's a good good um good tool. It's actually uh it's also nice to use it frequently because um, occasionally I think the ROS2 CLI adds new functionalities um you know from version to version as new versions of ROS get get uh, get pushed out and uh, and sometimes new yeah new new subcommands get listed, new, new flags get uh, created and just makes your life easier. I will, um, I'm going to send around a gist with a bunch of links in it. I put together an auto wear lesson, maybe a little less than a year ago. And it basically all fundamentally it does is just walk you through step by step every sort of subcommand in there. And it's, it's really helpful. Yeah, I highly recommend Cat's auto wear lessons. They're very, very, they're high quality um, and uh, easy to follow and goes deeper than what we've talked about today. Okay, next slide, Carlotta. Uh, so we're at 350. I don't think we have time to go through uh, the launch section. Um, which was a sort of an added bonus, but uh, uh, fear not, we're actually, uh, we're at a good pace here. We've got 10 more minutes left. Uh, first I'll summarize and then I'll leave it open for some additional questions. Um, we, through this workshop, we learned about Ross history, its design considerations. Um, we touched upon why you should learn Ross. Uh, there's, I think at this particular moment, um, in, in the history of humanity, uh, it's an incredibly exciting time to get involved with robotics. Uh, before Ross, the world, the robotics world was a little bit like the Wild Wild West. Everybody was coding up their own, their own drivers. Uh, things weren't being shared properly. Research wasn't being shared properly. Now you want to, you want to do, you want to do mapping, uh, just Google search Ross and SLAM and you'll get a whole bunch of libraries which you can evaluate and play with or augment or contribute to. Um, we talked about why you should learn Ross too, uh, because 
ROS 1 is going away. <laughs> so um, ROS 2 is the way of the future. It is, um, it is robust. I think it's easier to learn uh, due to the lack of the master. Uh, we haven't talked about the launch system, but the launch system is definitely easier, more intuitive than this XML-based XML based system that ROS 1 was using. Um, we went through a couple of hands-on learn, learning and coding sessions of certain ROS2 concepts. We taught, we worked on nodes. We learned about packages. We now know what workspaces are. We understand what ROS, ROS overlays and ROS underlays are, um, played with topics, um, published some messages using the ROS CLI. And uh, I think... Um, we did a lot in two hours, so you guys should be uh, give yourself an applause, and uh, hopefully um, everyone continues on their Ross adventures. Jazz hands. Jazz so, hands. Yes, and we would also like to end by thanking our facilitators and also encouraging you guys to all come to our um, other workshops. We do have two more um, Ross workshops. One of them is going to be to build a ROS robot that you are then going to program by using ROS. So please go to blackinrobotics.eventbrite.org to, um, I'm sorry, .com, I'm putting it in the chat and I'm trying to talk and type at the same time, um, to join some of our other workshops. Um, we have a Arduino workshop. If you have any um, young people or even young adults who wanna do an Arduino workshop. And we also have the one for children using VEX VR. I've also pasted a survey link. Um, if you would please help us to make sure we're hitting on the right tone in our workshops, um, that would be awesome. Are there any questions as we wrap up? I was just want to say it's been great. I also put uh, a gist in there with a bunch of links from today uh, that hopefully, you know, as you know, we gave you guys a like two hour taste. There's some stuff in there that should help you kind of learn more both about like open robotics and ross and like different aspects of ross so they're all in there and so hopefully that's a like next step or you can come back to this again too you know if you're like i need another round i think there's at least one more of this workshop before we do the building the ross robot workshops as well just shoot me an email if you're like i want another round i need to do this again or you know just let me know and um, we can put you back in this workshop again as well yeah, and last but not least, for those who had trouble with the uh, with the the on the hands-on coding or just uh, was some section you were confused, the lessons on Hadabot um, basically parallel this workshop um, that we've done. You know, all the code and all the example explanations. Uh, it's pretty much just um, it's uh, it, it's formatted in an asynchronous way for you to be able to work on it asynchronously on Hadabot. So feel free to go there. And if you have any other questions, um, you're welcome to reach out to me. My, I'll, I'll type in my email in the chat and I'm more than happy to answer any questions or, or basically help with the software setup if you have, you're still having issues with it. Anyone have anything going once, going twice? I have a question. Will the slides remain available? Yes. And if you, Patrick, if you absolutely need the um, recording, we can figure out a way to put it somewhere, maybe on a share drive so that you can click to if that helps as well. Sounds good, thank you. Anything else? Thank you, Kat and Jack, again. I don't know what we would do without you. I can't say Jack and Kat because the closest <laughs> target are Kat and Jack. <laughs> it's all good. Well, we also <laughs> have a fashion line. It's <laughs> And Simeon and Angela and Jasmine and Sophia, who hopped off a little bit earlier. Thank you guys all for coming. Um, I email everybody every workshop because I don't know whose schedule is what, but if you can't ever come, I'm, I'm not offended at all. But um, just thank you so much for being willing to help. And it's gonna be a busy summer. Um, we have way more workshops coming. I don't know what we're thinking. And we're, we're I think we're, uh, <laughs> we're drunken walking 
forward in improving each workshop one at a time. We are, we are. If you notice the participants this week were way more chatty. That's a good thing because we like when people talk to us. So that's great. Thank you everyone and wherever you are in the world, have an awesome day, night, evening, morning. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. It was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.